is up. Good morning. Yes. I'm bringing it up a notch. I'm wearing a party dress. Come on. Um, my name is Deanna. I'm Deanna on Twitter, if you're following along from home. And we're all here talking about power and the political power of the internet and what does power mean. And so when I started thinking about what I was going to talk about today, um, one of the first things I thought was actually of the Princess Bride. And I do not think that word means what you think it means. So let's start with a story. Back in February, who remembers the Susan G. Komen Foundation decides to defund Planned Parenthood's breast cancer initiative? So yes, people actually raising their hands, awesome. So um, bad thing, internet outrage happens and uh, people get really angry. There's uh, women everywhere were just so angry that breast cancer was politicized in this way and then realizing that our bodies are continually continually politicized in this way. So what do we do? People start tweeting, forwarding the emails, posting it to Facebook, and then people start talking about the money because the money was a big focus. People start talking, well, I'm gonna raise money for Planned Parenthood, or I'm going to stop giving money to Susan G. Komen. And I started thinking, well, <laughs> what, if you, uh, what if you don't have any money to give <laughs> or take away? And thinking about that, these are the women who are gonna be most affected by a decision like this, who are gonna lose access to low cost breast cancer screenings if something like this happens. So how did they get to participate? How did they get to share an outrage that they feel? So I created a Tumblr site called Planned Parenthood Saved Me. And I asked people to contribute stories of how Planned Parenthood had changed their lives in some way. And it blew up. Uh, I collected over 300 stories in just a couple of days. I launched it on a Wednesday morning, and by Thursday night, Rachel Maddow was reading from it on her show, and my head kind of exploded. And um, it was, you know, that wasn't even the most interesting part. The most interesting uh, part of its trajectory was looking at the traffic, and that more than half of the traffic came before any major media mention. And that traffic came from Facebook, from Twitter and Tumblr. People came to the site because they were sharing their stories with one another. So what does that mean? Well, it means don't mess with our boobs. Don't mess with our bodies. Don't mess with us. By Friday morning, Komen had partially retracted part of their story and everyone declared it a big win for Planned Parenthood and a big win for the political power of the internet, which it was but not entirely in the way that I think people think that it was. Because it's a little bit problematic how we think about power. We have this very linear trajectory that kind of happens. We think first, I have power. And then if we all get together, we will have power together, right? And then if we're successful in exercising our power in the world, then <laughs> we will be in power, yes. Um, and uh, that, that's interesting, but that's, that's not the entire story. So thinking about connective technologies, and, and I wanna be clear that I, I wanna talk about not just the internet. I wanna talk about those mesh networks, and I wanna think about how mobile networks are also uh, playing a part in how organizing and political power happens. These technologies are giving us, we all know, new ways to relate to one another and connect to one another. And they're giving us new ways to think about how our power works, but we're still sort of stuck in a, a kind of linear uh, way of thinking. And so there are three systems of power that I wanna talk about today. And I have to give huge props to Nilifer Merchant and Anne-Marie Slaughter, who both have recent posts that you should all look up about how power uh, operates in the world and, and how it may be changing. And it's also important to note that the systems I'm gonna introduce here are not mutually exclusive. So the first one is ad hoc power. And this is Clay Shirky's uh, infamous, ridiculously easy group formation, right? We come together quickly in a moment and in the next moment that can dissipate and, and that's okay and it moves on. And then the next one is networked power. And network power has stronger ties, uh, more solid, ties between the different nodes of who's participating it. 
Some people may think that this is related to relational power, if you're getting into to power theory stuff. And these people have a shared experience, or they have shared identity, or they have a, a shared, what's strongest here is that there's a shared component to how people are related to one another in network power. Then there's hierarchical power, and this is also related to resource power. And this is traditionally what we think about when we think about uh, people having external power in the world. And it's represented by a, a small number of people at the top having lots of uh, power, resource, influence, and as you go down the pyramid, you know, you're kind of out of luck as it gets less and less. So in the past, in political organizing, we've been very focused on traditional uh, hierarchical power, and we think this is uh, reflected in the language that we use. We talk about top-down organizing versus bottom-up and grassroots organizing. This is how we're thinking about things. And I know that you're in this room because you know better. You know that networked power is really important. We're like, aha, I know about the internet. I'm winning. <laughs> but, gotta go back to Indigo here. I do not, <laughs> I still think that you're not quite totally there yet, so I wanna take you there. Um, in the way that we think about this linear progression, we're also doing that in how technologies let us play this out. We start thinking, uh, well, let's get together quickly and easily, and then let's consider people part of our network and, and form relationships that are really solid with them forever, and then let's use our network power to influence what's happening in the hierarchy. And it doesn't always have to play out that way. So going back to, to Komen, looking at how that played out, um, we had the uh, hierarchical power in uh, the Planned Parenthood situation with Planned Parenthood putting out the call, uh, activating whatever resources they have within their uh, domain and their control, sending out emails, going down one hierarchy, coming up on another. There was the network power, which is the people who uh, activated on their own and did their own thing, uh, people like me. And it's important to note that these people have an emotional, an emotional connection to the work that Planned Parenthood does. And it's interesting to note that Planned Parenthood has also been very successful in navigating that emotional connection and turning it into a relationship. So that when something happens to them, it feels personal to me. Then there was the ad hoc, and this is a piece that I think a lot of people are missing. These are the people who were newly activated by this situation. This was their first time participating um, in a situation, in an activist uh, kind of way. Um, these were the women who contributed stories to my Tumblr, who spread the news of the defunding to their own networks, and you saw that this was new because of the language that was largely used. They were, they were saying things like, well, I don't normally forward emails like this, but breast cancer is really important to me. Or I, I don't normally share or post things like this, but this is something that I really need you to look at. And what happened in that situation, what happens with the power of ad hoc, is those are the people who are able to reach beyond the choir, who are able to reach uh, people who are not traditionally touched by a more networked, solid activism, who go, on, go out beyond a traditional feminist core. So the mistakes that we're making when we're thinking about how power works is that first we think that ad hoc power always has to be transformed into network power. And that's, that's not necessarily true, because first, it can waste a lot of time and resources for groups and organizations that just don't have the capacity to always work on those relationships all the time. And on top of that, it's actually ignoring the power of the ad hoc to reach the unreachable, to go into the places that we and our traditional organizing uh, networks and brains are unable to get to. That is the power of the ad hoc. The other situation that's happening is that we think that the, the whole purpose of networking ourselves together into networked groups of power is to organize the bottom people on the bottom rungs of the hierarchy so that they can climb up the hierarchy and either influence or, or kick out the people at the top of the hierarchy altogether. And that's a pretty limited view of what the power of networks can do. What we're looking at now and what we're just starting to see 
is how networks are wrapping around hierarchies. They're infiltrating them, and they're starting to break them down and dismantle them altogether. And as someone who sees hierarchical power as largely oppressive and destructive in this world, I'm so looking forward to seeing what network power, sprinkled with very conscious and intentional ad hoc power, and how that all can be constructive and supportive in this world. Thank you.